Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Emma and today I'm doing my February wrap-up. I feel like when I do my wrap-ups now, I'd like to talk a little bit more than just about books that I read during the month and kind of just the month in general because it is a February wrap-up. So February in general was not a very good month for me. Um, both kind of just life-wise and reading-wise. I did manage to read nine books, but most of them I did not enjoy. I had a five-star that I really, really loved. Um, but some good things that did happen this month was that I finally got to call Lucy for the first time from Crescent Pages, and we got to Skype, which was amazing. And that was a really good thing that happened, especially because we got to talk about BookTube. And it's so nice to talk to other people who do BookTube as well, because they kind of, they're in the same boat, they understand things, and... Um, it's just nice, so that was something good. I did have quite a nice chill Valentine's Day. I have a whole video. Uh, I did like a self-love V-Day vlog. I made this like super good vegan lasagna, so I think I linked the recipe in the video too, but other than that, February has kind of been the month for baking as well. I just made cookies last night, like a huge batch of cookies that are just, why? What have I done? I don't know. Um, but tomorrow is the last day of February, and I am ready for... Whatever March has to bring me, basically. I'm just really excited. I have been planning all of March, like, a bajillion different, like, videos, both booktube and non-booktube related, so. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of all I want to talk about. I'm not one to try and super focus on the negative things, although that is, like, hard not to do, but. Um, let's talk about books, because the first book that I'm going to talk about is a five-star read, which is insane. That never happens. So the first book of February that I read was also my first five star of the year and I'm so glad that it was. I've talked about The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde on my channel for a while now but um, I finally finished it at the start of the month and I'm just so happy that I did because it is now one of my favorite books in the whole wide world. It definitely competes for the place of my favorite classic as well. So much so that I think I'm going to be doing a whole video on it so like watch out for that but um, basically if you have never heard of this book or if <laughs> you somehow have managed to escape me babbling on about it for 15 hours the picture of Dorian Gray um, starts off with our young Dorian who's just arrived in London and he is just so beautiful and pure and aesthetic <laughs> and he has his portrait painted by his friend Basil uh, this portrait just kind of is everything to him, is everything to the painter and the painted, and it starts to take over Dorian's life, and as Dorian kind of descends and is corrupted and manipulated by his other friend, um, he just kind of loses it a little bit. He loses himself, both in the painting and in the world. I don't think I have to, like, not spoil this book, because I think everyone knows what happens in here, but, like, I don't really want to talk about the plot, because when you read Oscar Wilde's writing, it just, the plot does not, well, like, it matters, but Oscar Wilde's writing is unlike anything I've ever read before, like honestly. This book made me cry because his language was so beautiful. That is just like insane. That is an insane experience to have. I've never had an experience like reading The Picture of Dorian Gray. I know I might never have that experience again. and. I'm just glad because I think when I go back and read it for the second time around, like I'm 99% sure I'll have that same experience, which is just crazy. Like I can't tell you, I feel so inadequate next to this book. I feel like I shouldn't even be holding it or touching it, let alone trying to talk about it. Like just Oscar Wilde writing. <sighs> if you've never read this, oh my goodness. like go do it, go do it, go read it, and then come scream at me about it because this was just, there are no words. There are no words left. Oscar Wilde has taken them all and put them into the best formulated sentences in the world, and I can now do no better. So this was amazing. Now, unfortunately, this next book was not so amazing. Um, I'm going to talk about this really quickly because I think I've talked about it too much, and it definitely doesn't merit being talked about that much. It is Jekyll Loves Hyde by Beth Fantasky. I recently unhauled this. This will be going away. <laughs> from my home, which I'm very grateful for. So, Jekyll Loves Hyde is not really a retelling, but it's following the descendants of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from, yes, the novel by Robert Louis Stevenson, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So we're following Jill Jekyll, Tristan Hyde. They are both in chemistry class. They're pretty smart. They're like top of their class. And there is this kind of chemistry scholarship competition um, for an original kind of entry, an original science experiment. So they decide to team up and recreate the famous 
various experiments from the novel. This book opens with the funeral of Jill's father who basically worked in a lab and was doing some sketchy things and um, that kind of ties into the story as well and then they learn that their descent and kind of their madness is much more real. Tristan struggles with kind of this hide curse. I don't know. Guys, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I don't think um, it needs to be said that this book was really awful, like both in terms of plot, writing, literally everything. Um, it was just, it was not good. Oh my gosh, I don't know why I read this. So um, yeah, this was my worst book of the month, I think. So yes. This next play I had to read for school because it was on my British literature syllabus. It was also a reread for me, which was awesome, but that is Endgame and Act Without Words, mostly just Endgame though, by Beckett, Samuel Beckett. So yes, this was a reread that I enjoyed f way more on the second time round because I had kind of had more exposure to it, been able to read essays about it. I wrote an essay about it myself last year, so I just like knew more because if you go into Beckett, just kind of blind, like you just leave blind as well and like nothing transcends kind of thing. Nothing really passes through you because it is incredibly just dense. Like it's a very short kind of one line, one line play, um, but it is just chock full of literally so much meaning and so much like scary things that maybe like kind of aren't revealed to you the first time you read it. So basically, if I could sum this up, we have this house and we don't know whether it's kind of, it is an apocalyptic kind of situation. They can't really leave the house. They can't stay in the house. We don't know if there's been kind of a nuclear fallout or bombing or if there's just been natural disasters or if they just, we don't know. We don't know what's happened. They're just stuck in this house together. There's four people. We have Ham who is blind. He's in a wheelchair. Uh, he's kind of the tyrant of this house and he kind of orders around Clove who is the second man who's in this house. And then we have the famous parents of Ham, the last two people in this house, Neg and Nell, who famously reside in trash cans or garbage bins. Um, and people it's not it's not absurd this play is not absurd it's not absurdism um it's realism but basically they're in this house together they can't stay but they also can't leave and it's just this like torturous suffering alongside each other everyone is losing meaning everyone is literally losing their senses and losing not maybe their mind but like functions of their mind and such so it's just so hard to read it's really agonizing to read it's agonizing to watch it's not a fun thing to be witness to but um it is such an important play there's so many things going on in here and i gave it four stars because even though i didn't really enjoy it like that's not really the point i don't think you're supposed to enjoy this play but like i just really appreciate it if that makes sense so i gave this four stars this next book that i read was also four stars i had a really great start to the month um i decided to pick up outlander by by Diana Gabaldon. Is it Gabaldon or Gabaldon? I don't know. Gabaldon is so much more fun to say though. So it is a huge chonker and <laughs> this is kind of the reason I didn't read that many books this month. I think it's 800 pages. Yes, it is 800 pages. I found the audiobook on Scribd and I decided to give it a go. I had previously seen a little bit of the show Outlander but not very much, nowhere past season one. So I decided it would be good to start with the first book obviously and guys I loved it so much. If you don't know what this is about we have the Scottish Highlands in 1943 1945 and we have this couple Claire and oh my gosh I forget his name Frank Frank <laughs> Just because the other guy in here is just like totally overshadows him. Anyway, Claire and Frank, they're going on kind of a post-wedding honeymoon because the war is over. They finally have time to spend with each other. They've basically been apart for like seven years and now they're back together. They're in Scotland and Claire, one day she touches like the stones of the stone circle that kind of litter um, all the parts of the highlands. She accidentally touches a stone and is promptly brought in back to the year of our Lord, 1743. So I don't know what the hell that accent was, but she's in 1743. Obviously lots of things are going on. So from there, it kind of follows her being taken in by this clan, the clan Mackenzie, and her kind of meeting all these people, namely Jamie Fraser. I don't know why. I literally, now when I say his name, I can't do it without like a little bit of the Scottish creeping in because listening to the audiobook, the narrator had such a lovely Scottish accent that now I'm just like, I just go around my apartment being like, Jamie Fraser, do you ken my meaning? And it's just, it's not, 
it's not good because I don't have a good Scottish accent. Um, it's just so great though, honestly. This book was just like honestly a goodie bag of good things like we had scottish history that was so well done the description and the research of like flora and fauna and medicine that you can use in 1743 witchcraft clans scottish clansmen history and just like everything and then there was romance that was just like so well balanced obviously we know that claire and jamie fall in love but like it wasn't like that it's not like love at first sight it's not like insta lovey it was just so well done like they're great friends first and they kind of form this bond of like trust and friendship and loyalty and like they start to help each other out they have great witty witty banter and um eventually yes obviously they fall in love and it's just like amazing i don't really have that many bad things to say in here like at all one thing I will say was that Jamie definitely seemed a little bit too perfect of a person. Like, he didn't really have... Like, he had a few flaws, but they weren't, like, huge flaws. So he was just super duper perfect. But, like, honestly, I don't have any other bad thing to say about Outlander. It was amazing. I recently bought Dragonfly and Amber, the second book, and I think I'm going to be picking that one up quite soon. So I would honestly really recommend this. I enjoyed this tremendously and so much more than I was expecting which was awesome. And then I got to read The Golden Compass by Philip Pullman. This is the first in a series and guys I love this one as well. I gave it four stars too. It was so amazing. I have never seen any movies or TV shows or anything based on The Golden Compass um, or read the book. This was my first time and I really really enjoyed it. I had no expectations going in but basically we're following Lyra who is this young girl who's living in the colleges of Oxford um, because she's kind of an orphan. Her uncle is this kind of northern explorer and she's never allowed to go on trips with him. Um, also in this world everyone has a demon who takes on an animal form. Um, and kind of follows you around all day. They're kind of your little, um, not really sidekick, like they're very much equal to you, which was really, really cool. I love that. I love the relationship between people and their demons, which was so interesting. But Lyra's demon is named Pantalaimon, and he is just fabulous. He was one of my favorite characters in here as well. I would die for him. But one day her uncle comes back um, from the north, and he has all this information and research to show kind of the professors and the old scholars at Oxford, and Lyra just begs him to, like, take her back north, but he says no. And then, um, via, like, her friends all over Oxford and town and stuff like that, she starts to hear all these, like, terrible things happening, um, involving child stealing and child kidnapping from, by, uh, this group of people called the Gobblers that, like, no one really knows about, no one can find them, no one knows what's happening happening to these poor children who are being taken from their homes and their family. So when Lyra's friend is taken, she vows to find him. Uh, around the same time, this woman named Mrs. Coulter comes into town. She is also an Arctic explorer. She is honestly maybe like one of my favorite villainous portrayals in books because like just like the way she does it, the way she is presented as being vilified and so mean from Lyra's perspective was just so heartbreaking to me because Lyra really looks up to her. She's kind of this female idol to Lyra because all the men in her lives are doing all the work and the research and the scholarship and Lyra just wants that. So when Mrs. Coulter comes into her life and um, presents herself as another Arctic explorer, um, Lyra is just so smitten and taken with her and like you feel that so much I feel like that's something that a lot of people can relate to and then Eventually when Mrs. Coulter takes Lyra from Oxford promises to take her up north You just see that relationship kind of fall apart and Lyra just like obviously she's frightened and scared and angry But more than that, she's just so sad that this woman who was like her idol and her mentor and who she looked up to so much is not the woman that she seemed and she is just so manipulative but like in such kind of a, a deadly way i guess and i i don't know i just thought mrs coulter was really well done um and then from there there's just this huge adventure that eventually leads us up north to Svalbard in Norway, which was amazing. I've had this weird obsession with Svalbard for a long time, which doesn't make any sense because it is this very, very tiny island. But um, what makes it famous is that it has the, uh, oh gosh, what do you call this? The seed, what is it? <laughs> the seed tunnel? No. The seed jar. The flower jar. The plant 
the plant room, the seed bunker, the bunker of plants, the seed storage, the seed shed, the flower portal, the bunker, the bunker of desk, the bunker of flowers. Guys, I don't remember what it's called. I'm gonna put it right here. That's gonna be so embarrassing, but I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, it has like the huge bunker and kind of safe haven where everyone during the Cold War put all of the seeds of all of the plants in the world so that in the event of a nuclear fallout, we would have the seeds and such, which is really cool. Uh, also very scary, but it's there. It's on Svalbard. So anyway, <laughs> we get to Svalbard. I love polar fantasy. Like I adore polar fantasy and I'm so glad I got to read it during the winter. It was amazing. It was magical. I don't have any bad things to say about it. I felt like it never lost momentum, which a lot of the books I read uh, during the second half of this month did tend to do, but it was just like a straight shot of fun and adventure and just like amazingness. It was so magical. There were so many mysteries that still aren't solved, so I'm definitely going to be continuing the series and I loved it. The next book I read was a little bit of a disappointment. I did give it three stars. It was just quick and kind of easy to enjoy. But that book was A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. This is my first time ever reading Sarah J Maas ever, so that was really interesting. Like, I've always heard so many things about her. I don't think A Court of Thorns and Roses was a good place for me to start. I think I honestly should have started with Throne of Glass. I think I will enjoy that series so much more. Um, not that I'm saying I like hated this, but just for what it was, I feel like it is way too hyped and way too kind of overly um, placed on a pedestal and kind of worshipped. I probably don't have to talk about the plot of this too much. I feel like I was the last person on earth to start this series or start this book. Um, but basically I will say my problems with it. We are following Feyre. She's poor. She's trying to feed for her family. She kills a wolf. The wolf was actually a fairy. That's on her. She gets transported to Tamlin's house. Tamlin is one of the high lords of, oh goodness, Prithian. So they're in the spring court. I think one of my main problems with this book was not like the writing or anything like that, although there were kind of delicacies of the writing that I didn't enjoy, mostly that everyone seems to growl and snarl regardless if they are a wolf or not, which was just, I know that's a Sarah J Mass thing, but I was just like, why? Also, I think my main problem was just that the first, honestly, 300 pages, maybe 250 pages of this book was just plain boring. <laughs> like, Feyre is just kind of lottie dying around the house and talking to people and getting into all sorts of trouble that honestly isn't that exciting. And it took forever for things to kind of fall into place a little bit in order that more exciting events could happen. And like the buildup was just way too much. I know they were trying to solidify the relationship between Tamlin and Feyre, um, which was not believable at all to me. Like I just didn't understand how Feyre can go her whole life with this huge belief and this huge hatred. And I know that people can cast off their hatreds easily, but I just don't feel like Tamlin really did anything to merit that hatred being cast off other than being semi-nice to her sometimes. Um, I know that the relationship between Tamlin and Feyre definitely does change as the series goes on, which I'm excited for because I did not like Tamlin at all, but like I was saying, I just felt like the whole beginning and middle half of this book was honestly a bore fest. I kept waiting for something to happen, I kept waiting for exciting things to go on, and they never did, um, until we finally got to the court under the mountain. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil anything, but um, those were my favorite chapters, honestly, when she was doing the tasks, which were so strange. <laughs> the riddle in this book that Feyre has to solve was way too easy. That was not believable. Obviously, one thing that I have been kind of witness now to is Sarah J Mass's famous uh, formulas for relationships, which is interesting. I don't hate it um, because I am definitely recent trash now, which is fine, but it's it was just a little bit interesting. Also, this book had some of the steamiest romance in YA I've ever read. But like I said, I didn't hate it. I did give it three stars and I will definitely be continuing the series. I am way more excited to read Throne of Glass though and her new release, Crescent City. So um, I have so many more thoughts on this, but like I don't want this to be a spoilery wrap up because I know people don't really like that. 
but yes, moving on. This next book that I read was a little bit of a letdown, um, and it was so sad because I was really enjoying this book. I think if you watch my vlogs, I probably talk about this for a lot, so I'll just mention briefly We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Faisal. I really, really liked the first 150 pages of this. I was so intrigued, so present in the story. The world building was going magnificently. We are following really closely two people in this book, which I loved. The first we are following Nazir, who is kind of the crown prince of the not really evil, but definitely corrupt and just, okay, maybe a little bit evil, Sultan in this land. He is the assassin. Um, he has been trained basically his whole life to do his father's bidding and kill people, and he's just kind of miserable and sad. Um, and it was just so interesting switching back from Nazir to our other main character, the Huntress, who has to disguise herself as a man. She is known as the Hunter um, in order to provide for her small village since they are kind of on the edge of this really malignant kind of ever encroaching forest and desolate wintry kind of landscape called the Ars. And the Ars is basically slowly, slowly ever like creeping forward and taking over the land and taking over the towns and villages and houses of people who live there. So um, she's really just trying her best to kind of provide for herself, for her family, for her friends, and definitely for her village as well. Everything kind of changes one day when a few kind of soldiers from the Sultan's Keep decide to ambush her in the woods and ask her to come back to the keep. And she's like, no. She steps into the R's and there she meets the White Witch, uh, who gives her this letter. The letter basically says that magic has been drained from the land, from the kingdom. The kingdom is called Araria. I think I said that right. The letter is asking her to go to the island of Shar to retrieve this book that still contains traces of magic in it and kind of help restore and then combat the R's. So obviously she agrees. She wants to go on this quest. At the same time though, uh, Nuzir's father has asked him to go to Shar to follow the hunter, let her get the book, let him get the book at this point, and then kill him because they want the book for themselves. Obviously the Sultan wants the book. So then we have these kind of four people because they each bring someone along with them set off to this island of Shar. And I loved all of the characters in here. Honestly, honestly, I only mainly love the three main characters because Nazir brings along kind of the general of the army who is just... Oh my gosh, El Tair is amazing. I loved him. I just really loved our three main characters, and I loved the first beginning of this book. Like I said in my vlog, I'll just say it once. The middle of this book was really um, heavy and weighed down and not a lot happened, but then uh, she wrapped it up. Our author wrapped it up very brilliantly at the end. I loved the ending. I did give this book three stars. I really enjoyed it, and I would be interested in reading the next one, so... The second last book I read in February is one I'm going to mention very, very briefly because honestly there's not a lot to talk about. There was not a lot here in the first place. So that is Daughter of the Pirate King by Trisha Levenseller. I talked about this a lot in my vlog too, guys. Ooh, it was painful. I read this guy in one day and basically our red-headed pirate daughter captain named Alosa um, at the start of this book. This book just started immediately, like with no context, no kind of exposition. We're just there in the middle of the action, which is an amazing thing to do if it works. It, I don't think it worked in this case. So the book starts and she's being captured by this other ship, um, but then we very quickly learn that she's doing it on purpose to be captured because there's something on this ship that her father, who is the Pirate King, wants. And she has to kind of pretend to be a prisoner, pretend to be kept on board in order to kind of find, search out, and bring back this map, this part, part of the map, um, to obviously a treasure. So, um, this book definitely, uh, I don't know how to say this, it was a pirate book that didn't feel like a pirate book. You know when authors do absolutely no research on like the time period or the genre or anything of what they're writing and they just kind of go off the stereotypical tropes and the ideas and kind of the vague outline of what they think a pirate book or a pirate's uh, story should have and that was basically what happened in here. There were times when I'm like, is this, are we on the sea? Are we on a ship? Is are you a swashbuckler? And I didn't have a problem with the romance because it was kind of an enemies to lovers type of deal, which was interesting. That's like my favorite thing ever. But um, it was just so bad. Like I adore pirate books, and I wanted that pirateness in here. But like 
it was just like someone who has this vague idea has maybe watched Pirates of the Caribbean twice in a row and then decides that they have enough information to write a pirate book. And I know that's kind of all it maybe needed for this romance to flourish was just this little idea that they were on a pirate ship. It had every stereotypical pirate thing in it ever and I was just really let down. The only good thing I have to say about Daughter of the Pirate King was that the romance was all right like it was fine i kind of enjoyed it but that's really not what i dived into this book for and i was left just really disappointed so i gave it two stars if anyone has good pirate book recommendations please tell me and finally the last book that i read in february was the wind and the willows by kenneth graham i finished this book yesterday actually it is dubbed a children's book but it definitely doesn't really read like a children's book today uh we are following our four main characters who are all animals we have toad badger mole and rat and we just follow their kind of little adventures set in edwardian london and um we have friendships and rivalries and just whatnot to be fair i wasn't really interested in the plot of any of these ventures or adventures i just really enjoyed this basically for kenneth graham's writing he just makes you feel so cozy the wind in the willows is definitely such a cozy book um i did read a few little parts of it in my vlog uh for this week or last week so i will just leave that there it just makes you feel so sweet and happy and content um especially the relationship that mole and rat have and especially when badger is introduced into the mix and it was just quite nice there was not really one running plot line except for maybe toad's kind of obsession with industrialism <laughs> he gets addicted he could go on like my strange addiction because he gets addicted to motor cars and automobiles and whatever kind of mode of transportation becomes the fastest and the newest and um he goes around edwardian london as a toad stealing cars and then crashing them so so that was interesting um but like i said kenneth graham's writing is just so whimsical but kind of in a not really lyrical sense just kind of whimsical in its everyday depictions of life and food and nature and the descriptions in here are just so lovely so if you'd like a book that you don't really have to pay too much attention to what's going on but just appreciate the lovely um atmospheric descriptions i would really recommend the wind in the willow so i gave it three stars and i did um and i did end up enjoying it so three stars. All right, those are finally all of the books that I read in February. Um, I hope you guys had a really good reading month or at least a better month in general than I did. I'm really ready for March to just be a good month. So but once again, if you've read any of these books and want to talk about them, let me know. If you have any recommendations, oh my gosh, please. I want March to just be the month where I read all the good books. So definitely let me know. But thank you so much for watching and for being here and for spending your time here. Um, I appreciate you guys so much. And yeah, I will see you in my next video. Ciao.